read it over each other. It was about the gifts of the Spirit. It was about understanding. So in one aspect, Paul is like, here's how we operate in there. There's different gifts and gifts of this and wisdom and worry and all. These. And he's laying these things up. But at the very same time, it's a dysfunctional bunch. I wouldn't even, I would blush. Actually, I don't ever blush. I would, I would, it, you'd blush if I told you the sins that these people were involved in. It would make 2016 look like 2016. You know what I mean? And these people were involved in sexual sins and suing each other and all these things. And Paul was like, man, you guys are crazy. On one aspect, you want God so desperately and you want God to move in your life. But in the other same breath, you're the other side of the coin, it's like you don't even know God. Your life comes and you respond as if it's you. How can you be operating in the gifts of the Spirit at the very same time? You're suing each other and angry and bitterness. And, and Paul's like, man, I got to not only explain the gifts, but I got to explain life. Because if we are going to operate, then I've got to, he's thinking, I got to remove that lie of fear in your life that wants you to think that you can't handle things and that it's overwhelming for you. And, you know, and then you just, you know, you, 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 you listen. Just go on a missionary trip with a Christian. You realize how saved they really are. I was 18 years old, man. I went with this church in New Jersey to, to India. Can I tell you, at the 6 o'clock meeting in Wyckoff, everybody was saved. We all were like glowing, thinking we're going to do our crusades, feeding the homeless, touching the way. And we're all like, we got to, it's like Sunday. All of you look great for an hour and a half. Let me observe your conversation tonight. You know what I mean? So we start off and everything's great and we're all praying and everybody's excited. And then, and then we get on a plane for 36 hours. 15 hours in, friends, there ain't nobody glowing. I'm looking at these people like, my God, are we Christians? Backbiting and barking and cranky and old people. And I thought, Jesus, is it real anymore? Never mind when we touched down in India. I thought, my God, we a bad example of Jesus. I couldn't believe it. My first missions trip, I thought I would never want to do this again. I felt like we needed to be saved. We needed the ministry. And I realized quickly, everybody looks good an hour and a half on Sunday. Put a little bit of life in you. Little bit of discomfort, a little bit of confusion, a little bit of nervousness, a little bit of tighten here, and a little uh there, and somebody rub you wrong. It's, oh, my Lord. You ever drive with somebody, and it's all beautiful. Jeremiah is so beautiful right now. I've not driven with him. But then we get in the car, and the dude's honking his horn and tailgating and yelling, and I'm like, oh, my Lord, Jesus, what is going on with Jeremiah? Who in the world is he? Because everybody looks good on a Sunday hug. And Paul is saying, no, we can't be like this, man. Listen, you can't be in. And then the minute life comes, you're out. And it don't take much to flip you. Hello. I loved what happened the other night because I saw people that I loved that really got crazy. Some people got nuts. Some people got frustrated. And I'm like, wow. Just takes a little bit of for everybody to start manifesting. I love this because it's like grapes. When you're squeezed, you don't really know what's inside of you till it comes out. And if you're not dealing with a trial, just wait till tonight. I'm sure one might come your way. Jesus said trials will come. He said persecution will come. We can't live like it's never going to exist. It's real life, but you're an overcomer. And a conqueror can see God overcome. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we join, we join Paul here. And he's explaining some things to us. And in the middle, he says really some nuggets here. And he says in verse 12... Therefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. No temptation has overtaken you, which is common to man. I know, he's thinking, I know you respond in your flesh. I know you feel overwhelmed. I'm going to tell you nothing's new under the sun. No temptation is what's common to man. But I'm telling you, God is faithful. You won't be able to be tempted beyond what you are able. And with the temptation will also make way of escape that you may be able to hear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. 
And he goes on and on about walking circumspectly. And you know, another scripture I didn't include, if you really want to dig a little more, is Numbers 11. Starting at verse 11, you see this whole thing with Moses being overwhelmed by the people. And he just gets to a point where he's like, God, uh, is this even what I'm called to do because I feel overwhelmed? Come on now. And we have to stop looking at trials and pressure as a sign that God isn't with you. We have to stop looking at, at things that we go through in life as some kind of, you know, D or F on a report card. And that's absolutely not true. The Bible says when we get to heaven, you're going to get a crown for the things that you went through on this earth. Rejoice when you go through trials of many kinds. I mean, it's complete opposite of today. If there's any resistance, we don't want to take that way. If there's any traffic on the road, I'm like on my Waze app trying to go another way, even if it, you know, takes an hour more. And so we're going to look at three things this morning that I believe will unlock the conqueror in you and I believe will set you up for victory and overcome that lie of fear to tell you that you're overwhelmed. The first thing, and we're going to follow our notes here, uh, what you're going through, you need to understand, is normal strategy. Two words there, normal strategy. It's so funny because Paul said, no temptation has seized you, but what is is common to man. You know, the Bible says in the book of 1 John, all that is in the world, this all that Satan has in the earth, the Bible says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. You can almost limit every single thing in this earth down to those three things. There's nothing new under the sun. Somebody said, man, I feel like this is an attack, and you don't understand how strong. No, it's all common to man. What you're dealing with is just the enemy. It's all he knows how to do is try to torment you and get you off the focus that God has called you to. But unfortunately, there's some people, you have to understand, if you get around people that win, you ever get around, I get around successful people, right? People that you want to be like. They're successful in ministry and business and life and their family. And you know what I realized? They have a mentality that's all the same. They have a mentality that they're going to overcome and they're going to do all the things that God's called them to do and nothing's going to stop them. And opposition is just a speed bump. It's a mentality of winning. And I got to tell you the truth, failing has a mentality. When you you ever meet those people, they're like, like, listen, you can find someone successful, it blows my mind, they'll lose it all. And then they just start over and get it all again. They lose a whole company with millions and millions and millions, and all of a sudden they just start over, open a new company, and they're right back to it. Why? Because it's a mentality that when life comes, I just overcome it, and I keep doing what I'm called to do. But failing has a mentality. It's a mentality of fear. It's a mentality of I can't do this, and I'll never do this, and I'll never overcome, or I'll never amount to nothing. And unfortunately, some of you have been spoken over negatively so long, you just start to believe it. I saw a kid, fire in his eyes, as sharp as they come, playing instruments, just strong. And all of a sudden, the parent was a little whacked out. And they started looking at their kid, you know, examining every little thing. Oh, man, you know, I think you have Asperger's. And they started labeling him with all these sicknesses and all these diseases. And you got social anxiety like me. And you like this like me. I'm telling you, this kid was as sharp as they come. You see this kid today? He's exactly what they prophesied over him. He's nuts. That's not the kid I know. Why? Because you said so many things over his life and you cultivated this this failing mentality that he actually stepped right into what you said he was. Oh, I'm come on, man. This is real life, New England. So you need to be careful what it is you speaking out, what it is you're believing, what it is you're receiving, because failing has a mentality. And some of you have been told you're never going to do this. You're never going to do that. This is all you are. This is, and unfortunately, you start to buy into those lies. And then your limitations in life You've welcomed them in your life. The only limitations you have is the size of your dreams and the degree of your determination. It's the only limitation you have. But we have to understand that there's nothing new. He's not coming up with a special attack that's just for you that no one else is going to deal with. Come on now. Women, it's not, you're not, your emotions aren't being attacked in a rare way that nobody else is getting through. 
No, you just have a gift to hear and you have a gift to feel in the Holy Ghost and you have a gift to discern. But when your mom's crazy and your grandmother's nuts and everybody else is on pills, you start to feel like that's your life. That is not your life. It's a failing mentality. Well, you don't understand me now. We live in a day the church is almost as worse as the world. We need a pill to go to bed, a pill to wake up, a pill to deal with people. I mean, come on, man. Whatever just happened to some people are irritating. What, you know, I just know there's just some people are going to be in my life that it's like a faith test, and I love it. If you see me hug you, it's probably, no, I'm kidding. I, I love it. It's a faith test. Whatever happened to, okay, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sharpen my life, and you may rub me wrong, but I'm going to love you and celebrate the differences, and I'm going to pray for you. Come on, man. We don't even live like this anymore. We just want conflict to leave, and we just want the problems to stop, and we just don't ever want to go through hard times. Well, then you're in trouble. So it's important that we don't buy into those lies. Failing has a mentality. Being defeated has a mentality. It's what I call mentally, hear me now, is a spiritual ghetto. You have built a spiritual ghetto in your mind. Hello? I grew up around a lot of people that didn't have money, and they were less fortunate, and they were, you know, poor, living in ghettos. And you know what I recognized really quick? It's a death sentence. You were messed up, your mother, your grandmother. Your, I mean, I had people that were in gangs. It's like, yeah, it's cute when you're 16. Bro, you got a 40, you got a 65-year-old grandfather? It's a mentality that traps you, and it tells you that you're never going to become greater than this area. And, it, 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 you know, that's why John F. Kennedy comes in, and he builds these, these towers in New York City thinking that he's going to solve the problem. You put all these dysfunctional poor people in one tower, it's going to get worse. Because now we just took one crazy and we times it by a thousand. And we wonder why that's the war zone and those are the issue areas. No, it ain't nobody's wondering. You built a condo for the devil. It's a mentality that needs to, it's a spiritually ghetto mentality. And people come here and they won't succeed and they don't break through. It's because in their mind they've already rented a high rise. And they give in to it, and there's no filter, and they're constantly defeated, and they constantly live in fear, and there's no victory. I'm going to tell you, it's everything against what the Bible says you can have. We've got to evacuate the mental ghettos and begin to believe God that our attitudes can cultivate this. Are you with me? It's so important to understand that what you're going through is just not, no temptation has gotten you, but what's common to man. You understand me? You are not going through something that nobody else has seen. Sometimes you need to just break out of it. Hello. Sometimes if you ain't got nothing going on, you just need to get out of your pajamas, get out of the bed, put some makeup on, change your clothes, even if you don't have an appointment that day. You need to, come on, man, you need to get out of your head. My wife has been bedridden for months, a month. She's still going to get up, get dressed, do her makeup, do her, and she ain't going nowhere, and she knows she ain't. It's because the minute you start to get, the minute you let it go, the minute you stay in your pajamas all day, the minute you give in to that, you start to fall right into that hole. And it's not acceptable. You need to get up out of yourself, go to the store with no money, and just window shop. Do something to get out of yourself, get out of your face, get out of your head, and break the routine. My nose can get quiet. Some of y'all nuts. We don't live this way. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not acceptable. And you don't know until you get around non-crazy. Hello. Hello. Some people, man, your homes, it's like we accept this. It's not okay. It's not normal. We've got to be, we've got to get out of this and overcome the life that's outside of us. Because you give it away. You give it away. Your Facebook posts give it away. Your life gives it away. Your moping gives it away. You get, you're leaking everywhere in life because you've not overcome the spiritual ghetto in your mind. 
Hello. You're not going to catch me like, that's ridiculous. Imagine if you came to my house and I'm like depressed, sit on the couch, rocking back and forth with a blanket. Kick me in the face. I mean, straight up, put a boot in my mouth. That's the weirdest thing I've ever seen, man, because you've not overcome your mentality. Yeah, did the enemy have a plan for my life? Sure, but I gave him God's plan for my life. So nothing is, nothing is new under the sun. You're dealing with the same thing other people struggle with. Second thing you need to understand, it's a big one, is God is faithful. Paul said that, that no temptation to seize you what's coming to men, and the next thing he said is God is faithful. Say God is faithful. He is faithful in your life. He is faithful over you. You need to remind yourself of what he's done. You need to find a place in your life and remember the works of the Lord. The Bible says that they died in the wilderness because they forgot his mighty deeds. Don't you forget what God has done for you. And I was reminded of John 15, 15 this morning. It says, no longer do I call you servants. Uh Uh-oh, relationship change, relationship change. No longer do I call you servants for a servant doesn't even have a clue what his master is doing, but I've called you friends because everything I hear, I've given to you. If you are going to understand the faithfulness of God, then you must graduate in your relationship. The Bible says Jesus, he despised the shame and guilt that was put upon him. He struggled going to that cross, but yet he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. I'm telling you that your, that your setback is temporary. I'm telling you that, that what you're going through is going to be a testimony tomorrow, that the things you're dealing with today, you're going to stand on and overcome in the next day. Do you understand what I'm telling you? It's the opposite, man. The minute, listen to me, the minute you go through struggle, I know something good is taking place in your life. Hello. Use the opposite for you. You think opposition, uh uh-oh, something's wrong, bells, whistles, I'm no way. No way. I know you're touching something when the enemy's coming after you. I know you're standing in the right place, but you are not going to get a free ride up the side. Nobody gets a hall pass. It's war. And if you want to overcome, then you change the mentality to break the lie of fear that you're overwhelmed and you can't handle it. Because I'm telling you, God's going to give you a doctorate in what you're dealing with. I'm telling you that the struggles you're going through, you're going to stand upon and be a testimony to others to break through. But if you're not careful, you'll be stuck for 20 years in the same thing. Hello? Hello? I've met people in the most tragic situations. I mean tragic. I mean like give a pause as a moment of silence tragic. They lose their wife. They lose their husband. They lose their children. They lose their baby. I mean horrific stuff I wouldn't wish on my enemy. But yet I watch through the course of life how this one loses someone but yet God brings him to a higher, stronger level. I'm in awe of that faith. And then I watch somebody over here do the very same thing. Oh, child, it's been 20 years, honey, please. How much TV and napkins do you need to go through? It's been 20 years, and you still won't let God heal that area of your life. It's quiet in Connecticut. Kurt, are you, am I I okay, Kurt? Am I doing the right things? All right, I got you on my side at least. 20 years, listen, you talk the same way as if it happened yesterday. The same anger, the same pain, the same. I've seen a woman who had seven abortions. I'm sorry, can I talk real for you for a minute? I mean, you're going to leave here and act like you want to be real. Let's be real for a minute. Seven abortions, God healed her heart. I mean, can talk about it. God's healed her. She helps others. You got one lady who she's scared to even say anything because she's going to be judged and she hates herself and she don't think she can be forgiven. And how could God get? Come on. Honey, you went to a buffet and didn't eat. You had an all-expenses-paid trip on a cruise and didn't get on the boat. Hello? Wow, it's quiet. I hear overcomers. I hear the sound of people rising up and cursing the lies that have been in their life. 
and breaking off the trauma that they've been through. Come on now. Abuse, torment, these are horrible things in your life that you go through. But I'm telling you, God is right there to see you healed in your life. He is right there to give you freedom. He's right there to speak confidence inside of you. That we're not just giving in to every thought and everything that happens around us. I'm telling you, God is faithful. You are not supposed to live in torment for 20 years. You are not supposed to be held back. Come on now. You know how many people I see come in the church? They just like a bunch of beaten up people, man. It blows my mind. Blows my mind. If I, if, if, come on, man. I got to take it off of you so you don't get as hurt. You ever met a woman that dated a guy, she got bad breakup, but then she smells that cologne again and she starts getting all angry? Come on now. You get in a relationship and you're like, honey, you need to change that cologne because that reminds me of Reggie. You know what I mean? I don't want to smell like Reggie. Come on now. Y'all don't want to be honest. My wife is the most beautiful person on the planet, never had a relationship. She had one, she didn't have a relationship. She had one kind of connection with an evangelist. It looked like something was going to happen. She had a bad, ex- and I said, my wife, it is not half as bad as y'all up in here. My wife had one experience at an Orlando airport where she was supposed to be picked up. She was left for a long time, and it broke my heart, this lady. But guess what? When I come into Orlando, I ain't never been to Orlando. I'm like, M-I-C-E-K-E-Y, and not flying out of there weekly. But my wife comes the first time, and guess what's on her mind? We standing on the same curb that Joker left her on. Now, I don't care. I'm like, whoa, we in Orlando. No, we're on the same curb that she got abandoned for a whole day when he lied to her. Real, I'm telling you the truth. Problem is now you have to get healed from this. You got to take those attachments and take those memories and di- divorce them. Because I'm telling you Orlando is going to be our airport, honey. And I'm telling you, we're going to go in and out of the nations from Orlando. And every time we come into here, somebody's going to get healed. And now all we have is amazing memories attached to that airport. We've flown your family in and out of there. Every time I go to Jacksonville, I go to Orlando. It's a new place for us. How many of you people come to church and you come with the same baggage from your last church? How many of you people come here with the same, the same, uh, what do they call when you go through war and you, you, you like, P- okay, PTS, whatever. You traumatize, man. You can't even worship God without the ringing all around you. You can't even look at me without thinking I'm some, you know, tormenting, abusive, angry guy that hurts you in the last church. I want freedom in this place. He's faithful. Hello. I had to tell so many people, let me mess up on my own, please. Can I, can I make my own pastoral mistakes? Instead of living under somebody else's busted up, like, just give me a chance to mess up. I want to mess, just give me a chance to make a mistake so I, then I can have a fresh mistake with you. Now you coming up in here looking at me weird because I didn't look at you or hug you or talk to you. Come on, man, what is this? Man, this ain't a nursery. We overcomers, we big kids, friends. God is faithful. He's faithful to set you free. He's faithful to heal all your broken hearts. Come on. Man, I've been through hell and back. I felt nothing. And Orlando's a wonderful airport for my wife. (laughs) Hello. Man, you need healing, dude. You need healing. You need healing. You need healing. You need healing. I learned early on that we, I mean, I learned early on that as pastors, you're not going to really have many people around you because everybody's messed up, man. They come with their own agendas, their own background. They judge your words. They manipulate you. There was one old saint that was so precious in our life. And she, my wife had a big move, man, Vancouver to here. I mean, really, dude? You're leaving Vancouver. Anyone you've been to Vancouver? Oh, my Lord. That's my point. Jim, great. That's wonderful. (laughs) She leaves that. Six million people, fashion, everything's beautiful, mountains. She comes here. 
and we didn't even have a church. It was like, here's the promised land, honey. And I'll never forget, she's praying on the phone with this lady and, 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 and my wife says, yeah, man, I, I know it's God's plan. I just don't want to be here. This woman thought she was saying she doesn't want to be here on earth and wants to kill herself. What? Went and spread rumors about my wife. My, literally my wife, seriously. My wife did. <laughs> just because she was trying to open her heart to somebody and say, yeah, just right now, and I'm going to do it. Right now, I don't, I don't want to be here either half the time. And this woman thought she said she won't be on this earth. Get the flip out of here. This woman's crazy. But guess what? You better get over it. And my wife had to learn to love people and trust them, and it does not matter. We have to be held to that standard. Y'all, it's pretty optional. But you better make a decision that the trauma of the past is going to be broken. You better make a decision that you're going to trust new, you're going to love new, you're going to look at things new, you're going to allow the past to be broken off of you. Can't even get to point three, man. We have a problem. The third thing is that you need to realize is you've been designed. You've been designed. There should be a period there. You're carefully constructed. You're designed. You know, I was driving in Pawkatuck and there's this building, St. Michael's or whatever, and it, they like tore it down. I still don't know what they did, but nothing is more heartbreaking than seeing one of these destroyed. Because I need to tell you something. In your house, it ain't built 2% as good as this building is. Not 2%. Your house, if you put a floor in, counters, give it 10 years and it looks like a ghetto. Your cabinets will be, your roof doesn't even last 20 years. Do you understand this? It's the cheapest of the cheap. It's not constructed well. You're constantly remodeling, but they built this and you don't need to do anything to it and it's been 200 years. Why? Because the architects did it a little differently. When they built the plans and when they put the best of the best in here and they put all the detail that we don't go the lengths for anymore and they go out of their way and they build a building and they say, this is what this structure will hold. The roof will be the same. The, and of course you do minor things. That's not what I'm saying. But nothing close to your house. In 200 years, I can count two times that they had to do some pointing and stuff. Really? My siding's falling off and it's five years old. Let me tell you something. You don't, you don't judge the capacity that a place can hold after you build it. You do it before. Paul said to the Lord, can you remove this thorn of the flesh? And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. You better stop asking God to take things away in your life that grace is trying to move into. That's good. You have been carefully made. You have been constructed. The devil came to the Lord in the book of Job and he said, I'm looking for people to attack. I'm looking for somebody to, to, to torment. And God said, why don't you consider Job? I've constructed him well. I've built him to handle this. I know that he can handle this. I'm telling you this morning, God has constructed you well. I'm telling you that he is the master architect. What you're going through, he's designed you to handle. What you're going in life with, your capacity is far greater than you think. He didn't build you like some sham building in New London. He built you like this structure to handle the ages of time. He's built you to overcome everything that this life is going to throw at you. You're not a trailer. You're not some beach shack that's going to get blown over by the water. No, the foundation of God is in you. You can handle it. You can handle it. You realize this. You don't build something and then say, hey, let's see what the weight capacity is. You don't build an elevator and go, okay, we forgot to decide how many pounds is going to go. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Ah, okay, okay, that was a little too much. 
How much do you all weigh? Okay, minus you and we can do it. That's stupid. Nope. And God doesn't, God doesn't put himself in you and then try to see how much you can handle. It's like this building, he builds it once and he gives you the emotions of God and he gives you the power of God and the peace of God and he says, now get ready. You're going to overcome. You're going to overcome. You're going to get through it. You're going to handle it. I'm telling you, you're going to overcome. Nothing is going to touch you. You better both start believing in you. You better start believing in you. Sickness doesn't have a hold. Emotions have to be made whole. Uh, the fears, they're broken. Anxiety is broken. Trust, it's yours. Well, what is the future going to hold? Who cares? I know that I'm in his arms. I know that he's over me. He is watching over me. I'm not going to try to be the God of my life. I'm going to trust him in all circumstances. And I'm leaning on him. I'm not trusting in men. I'm not trusting in my boss. I'm not trusting in my job. I'm not trusting in my school. I'm trusting in God alone. Because he's made you to handle everything. That was a quick and powerful third point there. It was like a shot. You don't know what's in you till you go through it. So true. You don't know what you can handle till you go through some things. Hello. My faith became secure when I went through trials. I became the man that I dreamt I could be when I lost everything. Come on now, nobody will sign up for that. That's how you know who you are. You are an anchor of faith. Because Christ is in you and with you. Isaiah 43, 19. And I believe this this morning over your life. I love this scripture. Behold, I do a new thing, and shall it spring forth, and shall you not know it? Everybody wants God to do a new thing. There's only one prerequisite of allowing God to do something new in your life, because ain't nobody want an old thing. It's the verse before. We love the new thing scripture, but we don't want to read the context. The verse before says, do not remember the former things. Oh, oh this is going to get loud and quiet. Do not remember the former things, nor even consider the things of old. Good. Behold, I will do a new thing. Watch out that you will miss it. You can miss the new thing by holding on to the past. You can miss the new thing by considering all the old thoughts and the old patterns and the old ways. You can miss a new opportunity in God because you're traumatized by what went on yesterday. And God says, Did, just don't even consider the former things. Forget them. Let them go. Clear out the room in your heart so he can begin to do a new thing. Open up a new area of your life so God can begin to move again. Let it go. Let it go. Let the old things pass off out of your life so God can heal you afresh. Hello. Hello. If you've been married before and you're trying to get married again, you better be healed. You ain't no run. Nobody wants you in their life with yesterday's baggage. Ain't nobody wants you showing up with five other dudes' issues. Come on, man. If you're going to believe for the new, then get healed. If you're going to believe for the fresh, then get right. Because then all you become is one busted up relationship after another. Man, if I can't talk like this here, we have no hope in the world. I'm going to tell you right now. You my people, and I can't talk like this. We have no hope. There's no hope in America at all. This has to be the one place in the world that's my people. This is New England, man. Come on. My wife thinks every other person is rude. That's you. <laughs> at least you can act like you know me. Ain't nobody got time for your issues, man. God has, he's faithful. Yes, he is. Don't bring it to somebody else. Come 
Don't bring into another job. Don't bring into your family. Don't bring into your children. Hello. I could not be a father to my, my, my children with my wife if I was still abused from my past, from my past children. Do you understand me? No, listen, I'm talking big kid talk for a minute. There's wounds of a father. I didn't have one. Stunk, right? Don't know who the dude is. And then there's wounds from being a father. Come on, big kids. I had to be healed from both to ever be a successful father of my kids. What do you need to be healed of? What is in your life holding you back from receiving the new thing? Because what's coming, you better be anchored. You better be sure. Friday night was the best example of all. You sh I, if you saw the video, it'd bring blood-curdling chills to you. I'm literally preaching on the sign of the times. I'm preaching on uh, being having discernment, which please, so few people have. And the minute I preach on the sign of the times, I think I said, you need discernment. Some dude's flying up here 80 miles an hour or whatever and just, I mean, totals the car right outside this door. You could hear it on my microphone. It was blood. I've never heard anything like that. But the uncertainty that fell on this place, I thought, my God, we need help. Are we ready for uncertainty? Are you anchored enough to call on to God in that moment? I was, well, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. The minute it happened, the dude took off. I prayed and broke the plans of the enemy and prayed that he would be exposed and caught, and he was. There's no, there's no worry here. If you're standing in that place, you don't worry about what your future holds. He's your protector. He's your healer. He's your anchor. You're not a servant. You're a friend. And if we're going to eliminate, remember what I talked about perfect love casts out fear? It's not like you receive love and then you're like, ha-ha, fear, now go. Nope. When you receive it inadvertently, fear doesn't have a place. When you live right, fear doesn't even have, he can't even knock on the door anymore. There's no room. There's, he don't even have a, I have so much of God and purpose and peace that he doesn't even knock, he can't even knock anymore. You understand me? He can't even knock on the, he can't even knock on the door. He doesn't have a voice. And it doesn't matter what you go through. I remember I was 18 years old, and somebody gave me a word and said, you're going to fly around the world. And I see this, and I see first-class tickets, and I see suit, and I never flown. I was like, oh, no. But I know it's what God's called me to do. So that day that we were in a plane crash, it wasn't a question in my life, am I going to fly again? You know how I have ministers, ministers that you probably watch on TV that won't get on a plane. It wasn't a question. Am I called to do it or not? Is he, is he asked me to do this? Then I don't care. I won't get on a roller coaster. But if there's purpose attached to it, I'll fly in the air with nothing. I don't care. If I'm called to do it, then I don't even ask my flesh what it thinks. You don't have a say. It's what we're called to do. Fear doesn't even have a, an opportunity to knock. But some of you have eaten dinner with fear so much, you, not, you call him over. And that's not how we're called to live. We're divorcing the voice of fear. We are divorcing that lie so we can have peace that God has called us to have. Let's stand. We're going to pray. Jesus. One who is and is to come The power of the risen one The God who brings the dead to life You're the God of miracles You're the God
thank you this morning for the lie of fear to be broken. Father, I thank you that we are standing as more than conquerors, as overcomers in this place. And Lord, I thank you that the past is broken. The past is the past. Lord, we give you the past. We give you the hurt. We give you the pain. We thank you that you can heal all things. And Lord, I speak a new season. I speak a new day. I speak a new dawning, a new morning into this house. That God, from this point forward, the page has turned. We can walk circumspectly, God. We can walk in confidence of you. Lord, we thank you that you whom the sun sets free is free indeed. That no longer will the lies of the world have a hold on us. No longer will we give in to the, the, the lust of the flesh, the, the fight of wanting to, to argue. And No, that is not our life any longer. God, we stand on your truth. We stand on purity. And God, let it spill into every home, every household, every marriage, every, every child, every woman, every grandmother, every mother, every father, every single lady, every single guy. God, let it spill over to our home life that we will begin to see transformation every Everywhere we go. Lord, I thank you that fear does not have a hold. I thank you that you have empowered us to do it, that we can overcome, that we can get through it, that we will, God, uh, uh, do everything you've called us to do in this life. And we stand this morning and declare we are not overwhelmed, that we are not overwhelmed because we're standing in the shadow of your wing. Lord, I thank you, God, that this week is going to be a week of breakthrough. God, as we go this morning, we leave our eyes wide open to where you are in everything, who you are in everyone. God, bring the reality to us in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Love you guys. Bless you. Hallelujah. Please thank the kids' workers as you go. They've been, they stayed over a few minutes. Love on one another. We'll see you Friday. Come on.